So our next speaker is uh, Professor Augusto um, Zimmerman. Um, he is a former Western Australian Law Reform Commissioner and is the current Professor and Head of Law at the Sheridan Institute of Higher Education in Western Australia. I don't have time to go through all of his achievements and his awards, but they are, believe me, uh, quite an impressive collection. Um, he's a distinguished legal scholar, prolific contributor to the National Discourse on Freedom of Speech and the Rule of Law, and he has been a consistent and long-term critic of Australia's domestic violence laws, which he argues, correctly in my view, seriously compromise the presumption of innocence and the application of fundamental principles of due process and natural justice. He's received multiple awards, but um, one of which is an important one was um, his international role. Um, so um, the paper that Professor Zimmerman's proposing to present to us, uh, the talk he's going to give is called Domestic Violence Orders Violate Human Rights. So could I ask you all please to welcome Professor Zimmerman. It's a, a privilege to be here, and I must thank my friend Bettina for this opportunity. And um, it's something that doesn't give me any excitement to have to discuss these issues because I had to unfortunately interact with uh, the victims. Uh, I was indeed a law reform commission uh, for five years. I'm really honored and delighted to have this opportunity to uh, comment on, on this subject and express my feelings even about uh, what can indeed occur to uh, innocent victims of the system. You can see by my, my, my accent that I'm not from New South Wales. You see that by my accent that I'm from Western Australia. My accent is from... So what I have here is a short paper just to make sure that I actually address everything that needs to be addressed. So you please forgive me if I'm not being very spontaneous, but I think the information must be given in a proper manner. And uh, some accounts of the victims I will disclose then after 10 years, and it will be published hopefully in Quadrant magazine. Uh, I'm saying this before I communicated this to the editor, but I hope he will be kind enough to publish this paper. Although violence by women against men is a phenomenon that has received little attention in the media and in government for nearly four decades, actually five, I must say, the best research reveals that men are also frequently targeted. Since the 1980s, more than 200 academic studies have demonstrated that despite the common assertion most partner violence is mutual, and that a woman's perpetration of violence is the strongest predictor of her being herself a victim. There is a misleading uh, feminist narrative aimed at presenting domestic viol violence as uh, solely a male problem, thus placing all the blame on men as a collective group. From the nation's media reports, public inquiries and official campaigns. One should be forgiven to think that men are the sole perpetrators of domestic violence. However, data keep, keeps mounting 50 years of research, which indicate that domestic violence may be perpetrated by both men and women against their partners. About 10 years ago, an official letter by the Harvard Medical School commented on the findings of a comprehensive analysis of more than 11,000 American men and women aged 18 to 28, and the statement concluded, and I quote now, when the violence is one-sided, women were the perpetrators about 70% of the time. Men were more likely to be injured in reciprocally violent relationships, 25% than were women when the violence was one-sided, 20%. That means both men and women agreed that men were not more responsible than women for intimate partner violence. 
They find this cannot be explained by men's being ashamed to ad admit hitting uh, women because women agreed with men on this point. The Harvard Medical School's statement was based on a seminal work published in the American Journal of Public Health in 2007. Written by four experts in the field, it seeks to examine the prevalence of reciprocal, that's 2A, and non-reciprocal reciprocal domestic violence, and to determine whether reciprocity is related to violence and in injury. After analyzing the data, which contained information about domestic violence reported by more than 11,000 respondents on 18,000 heterosexual relationships, the following conclusions were reached. One, a woman's perpetration of violence is the strongest predictor of her being a victim of partner violence. Two, among relationships with non-reciprocal non violence, women were reported to be the perpetrator in the majority of cases. Three, women reported greater perpetration of violence than men the men did, 34.8% 30, against 11.4% 11, reciprocally. The Partner Abuse of State of Knowledge project is broadly regarded as the most significant international summary of the data available. This is undoubtedly the world's largest and most comprehensive research on domestic violence summarizing 1,700 peer-reviewed studies and published in the prestigious peer-reviewed journal Partner Abuse. The results, which are summarized in a comprehensive 2,300-page review of the relevant research literature, notably identified higher rates of female perpetrated domestic violence than male perpetrated domestic violence, 28.3% versus 21.6%. Across the studies, it was found that 43% of men and 41% of women reported coercive abuse. As for motivation, the authors of this literature review concluded that men and women often perpetrate domestic abuse from very similar motives. While domestic violence against women is constantly highlighted by the mass media, domestic violence against men is rarely reported. Men who sustain domestic violence face numerous obstacles when encountering the social service. These victims you suffer from a complete lack of support, and there might be even the assumption that they must be the perpetrators. To test the av availability of social service providers to male victims of domestic violence, a Melbourne-based psychiatrist once contacted the men's referral service run by the government of Victoria. This is how he's experienced his uh, interaction, or uh, that's how he reported. I rang then on one occasion in relation to male victims. Both times I was told that if I had dug deeper, I would have discovered that the victims were actually the perpetrators. The founding model is set up to fit with the narrative about gendered violence allowing funding to only go to female victims and never to male victims. This means that some service providers embrace a radical feminist narrative to domestic violence. For instance, the referral service contracted by the government of New South Wales is on the record claiming that we need to be cautious in assuming that a man assessed by the police is truly a victim. We should not believe that, but that's the opposite as when a, a woman makes such allegation. The information provided to, bat, to battered men is often predicated on the assumption that every man must be the perpetrator. Male help seekers report that their complaints are never taken into consideration or seriously. Yet their partner's allegations are always given serious weight. 
Some report experiences with their abuse partners misusing the court system to block access between them and, to make it worse, their, vic their children, actually, or to file false allegations with child welfare, welfare services. It is also reported that some men have stayed with their violent female partners to protect their children from their partner's violence. These men are worried that if they leave their violent wives, the system might still grant custody of their children to the abuser, to, to the female partner who is the abusive one. Although many men report domestic abuse for the reasons above, um, these, uh, these, numbers are never, these numbers are never entirely clear or accurate. There is a widespread belief that abuse can only happen to women. This prevents battered men from coming forward due to a reasonable fear that they are not going to be believed. For instance, emergency, emergency clinics tend to ask only women and not men about domestic violence origins for their injuries. This is so even after these emergency clinics find that the men admitted in hospital with injuries are a result of domestic violence. In Australia, thousands of fathers have had their contact with their children limited to a few hours and often spending huge sums of, uh, on lawyers fighting to be able to care for their children overnight. Across the nation, thousands of very good people are legally prevented from reconnecting with their children. And they have been told in mediation sections or by divorce lawyers that there is no hope of overnight contact with them. Add false accusations of domestic violence, and then the father will be required to prove his innocence before he is allowed within 100 meters of distance to see the kids. Indeed, the restraining order even when based on allegations that are unsubstantiated, is a powerful weapon in the fight for primary custody and restricted access. So perhaps I now have to talk a little bit about my experience as a law reform commissioner. They were not very pleasant, but that, I must say, these experiences were quite enlightening. I have learned a lot with, with them. And I can talk a little bit anecdotally if I have time, but let's see how it goes. A domestic violence order is a restraining order issued by a court that sets out specific conditions that must be obeyed, preventing a per person from contacting, tracking, or attempting to locate the protected person, and preventing a person from being within a, a certain distance of the protected person. The terms used to identify DVOs, domestic violence orders, differ across jurisdictions. And if, I'm not, if I'm not wrong, here it's called apprehended domestic violence order. Domestic violence orders are the most broadly used legal response to allegations of domestic violence. Almost half, 47% of 133,000 of all civil cases filed in the magistrate's court involved DVOs. While it's crucial that the legal system protects all victims of domestic violence, at the same time, one must recognize that domestic violence restraining orders are occasionally sought for collateral reasons. For instance, when a person seeks such an order, although she is not truly a victim of violence, for years, Fathers' groups have complained that pseudo victims and overzealous courts often misuse DVOs that should be used as a shield against real, authentic instances of domestic violence. Many cases of domestic violence have ended up in our know, courts where allegations have been entirely disproved. And sometimes, many years after the alleged offenders, found themselves evicted from their home, alienated from their children, 
arbitrarily arrested, suffering incommensurable damage to their personal and professional reputation, and financially bankrupted after facing huge court costs to defend themselves from false and malicious accusations. The most uh, cursory scrutiny reveals that the alleged epidemic of domestic violence is actually quite fabricated. None of the statistics purporting to quantify the incidence of domestic violence are entirely based on convictions through jury trials or even formal charges. These accusations are based on reports that are not necessarily substantiated. Rather, substantial incentives are provided by government-founded interest groups and government agencies for women to manuf manufacture accusations and exaggerate its incidents. Some members of the Australian judiciary have agreed that false claims are often sought for collateral reasons related to family court disputes, including child custody. For instance, a survey of 38 magistrates in Queensland reveals that 74% agree that DVOs are often used for tactical purposes related to family law dis disputes. Likewise, another survey of 68 magistrates from New South Wales indicates that 90% of them agree that DVOs are commonly sought as a tactical device to aid applicants with court disputes and or to deprive former partners of contact with their biological children. Some empirical studies indicate that men who are accused of domestic violence are constantly threatened with lies during court proceedings. These important findings show that men who fear being victimized by false allegations of domestic violence are fully justified in having such fears. A major problem here is how restraining orders are issued and the grounds for which they can be made. There is a notorious lack of scrutiny about the nature and substance of these complaints. Of course, while it's not possible to know if every DVO is legitimately applied, some applications are known to be grossly unmeritous, meritorious. Time is a possible sign that someone is seeking a DVO for reasons other than concern for physical safety. A common example is when, after initiating custody proceedings, unethical lawyers instruct clients to apply for a restraining order so as to obtain an upper hand at family court proceedings. According to David Collier, a retired judge from the Federal Family Court, these orders have become a major weapon in the war between parents who want to secure full custody of their children. <coughs> the strategy consists in the ability to defame another person with no need to provide evidence. These accusations can tear families apart, can tear families, can tear families apart, but are based on the mere allegation of another person. I have more to say, but I have only seven minutes now. Perhaps I should go back to uh, what I have uh, promised to do to talk a little bit about my role as a law reform commissioner in Western Australia and what happened to me. I served as a law reform commissioner <coughs> in Western Australia from 2012 to 2017. <coughs> I don't like to talk so much about this because I feel very distressed. I received many phone calls from the victims some of them suicidal. I just find it unbelievable that anybody could support such a thing because these um, laws that have destroyed many people's lives, and I feel quite emotional about this, 
I received from calls of people telling me that after contacting me, they would commit suicide. They have lost everything. How on earth someone has the courage to defend such a thing? Good people, children, have taken their lives because of this. I served as a law reform commissioner, commissioner in Western Australia from two, 2012 to 2017. During, the, during this time, my fellow commissioners and I conducted a comprehensive review that ultimately led to the enactment of the restraining orders and related legislation amendment, Family Violence, Violence Act 2016. In December 2013, 2013, our commission published its discussion paper presenting 53 specific proposals for reform and raising 29 questions for discussion. The paper followed a comprehensive consultation with more than 150 individuals expressing their concerns about family and domestic violence. The commission ultimately received 43 written submissions and we conducted additional official consultations to resolve matters arising from these submissions. Published in June 2014 and entitled Enhancing Family and Domestic Violence Laws, a final report comprehensively addressed all the facts of legislation dealing with family violence. Our report explicitly recommended, among other things, that such laws should necessarily provide a fair and just legal response to family violence. Our recommendations were considerably ignored by the government. The Restraining Orders and Related Legislation Amendment 2016 in WA which received royal assent in, on 29th of November 2016, updated the definition of domestic violence and promoted um, a new view of domestic violence that extends to normal interactions between partners. More specifically, the new legislation dangerously extended the relax relaxation of evidence rules that were available for entering orders to final decisions. On the occasion, the then Attorney General contended that a new family violence restraining order was designed to reduce the onus of the proof because that would be better to deal with the matter. And the police minister of the day declared that, and I quote from her, we are sending a message to the courts that he would prefer to err, err, on the side of the accuser, and err on the side of granting such a restraining order. This woman is a criminal, because to make such a statement is absolutely outrageous. So this is extremely dangerous, because it removes the presumption of innocence, and it assumes that it is entirely acceptable to commit mistakes on the side of the person who makes an accusation. The removal of evidence erodes the right to remain innocent until proven guilty. In our final report, the Commission rejected these moves, noting that they were likely to exacerbate the existing problem of overuse and abuse of restraining orders, which are known to be used for tactical purposes in the context especially of family law litigation. The extension of the removal of evidence, even to a grant of final restraining orders, is particularly abhorrent. This is totally against what the Commission recommended. And I then have to have very unpleasant interactions with the then Attorney General. I would like to just have a peaceful and quiet life. But then he started to say that the changes were based on my report. And I don't want to have blood in my hands of being accused of being having such thing in my hand. So I had to speak out, and I went to the newspaper, the, the journalist, the journalist from the Australian newspaper contacted me, asking if the, these changes were based, on, were based on our report. And my um, comment was that this was 
a joke. This is a lie. He was not happy with my comments. He thinks that I work for him. Uh, he doesn't understand that a lot of Hong Commission should have independence to say whatever he thinks it's appropriate. That's why I was appointed to be a commissioner. Perhaps they committed a mistake to appoint me, but <laughs> I was not there to serve the government. I was there to protect the, my community and the common good. I love you guys. And then I started to see these things happening on a daily basis. People calling me and doing these things. The Attorney General once called me and said, I need to talk to you as a matter of urgency because you are not serving the purposes of uh, our agenda, being advanced. And he wanted the government, the Liberal Party, to be re-elected. And in those days, I was still a member of the Liberal Party. I was a senior vice president of the Liberal Party in my division. And, and they thought that I was compromising the prospects of the party to be returned. And then he called me saying, I want to have a conversation, a very serious conversation with you. And I said, look, I'm not available for you this week. I have to pick up my kids from school tomorrow, and I have to promise to have some drinks with some of my friends. You have to wait about a month or so. Uh, I'll give you the time. I'll give you the time. And, and just to make sure that I can put this, play, this man in his place. He actually told me that I should to reconsider my role as a commissioner just for trying to do the right thing. And then I told him, look, I think you have to reconsider your role as a, an attorney general because you are not properly qualified for the job. You are going to undermine due process, further undermine due process of law. And you know, after this, uh, it's a, such a traumatic, terrible thing that I now write about other subjects. And uh, uh, due to this uh, experience of people calling me suicidal, people losing everything, having the bank accounts exploded, uh, the, the stories are quite similar, actually, of total obliteration of a person's lives. And you think that could be uh, um, perhaps a person who is not uh, equipped or qualified enough to be able to defend himself, but these are... Uh, Law professors have become the victims. These are barristers becoming the victims. Everybody can be victimized by this. Isn't that a terrible situation in this country that a perfectly innocent person can have his whole life utterly and completely obliterated just on the basis of a false accusation? How on earth a human being would have the courage to defend such a thing? I just, it is actually perhaps a demonstration that how evil, evil some people can be. And I promise you, God willing, that I'll continue to speak out. God bless you and protect you and I promise you that I'll continue to fight the good fight. Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.